Now, I want to look briefly before we go today at chapter 63. This is one of the most dramatic passages in the Bible and very little understood. Let's look at it, chapter 63. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bosra, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendour, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? And then a response to that question. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Then another question. Why are your garments red, like those of one treading the winepress? And the answer? I've trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger, trod them down in my wrath. Their blood spattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance, remember chapter 61 verse 2, the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption has come. I looked but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support so my own arm worked salvation for me. And my own anger, wrath, sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. It's a very graphic passage. What's it talking about? It's talking about the end of the world. You can't have a day of salvation without a day of judgment. The greatest sin is the rejection of love. And those who reject the gospel have committed the worst of all sins. So ultimately, at the end of the world, when most of the world will be attacking the Christian church, those who are proclaiming the gospel, not a denomination, but those who are giving the gospel, the world will turn on them. According to Revelation 13, there'll be the beast and the false prophet, an image of the beast, fire coming down from God out of heaven, mark of the beast. It's a false trinity, the beast, the fire, <coughs> the lamb, father, the spirit, the son. It's a false trinity. There'll be a false gospel. And at the end of the world, apostate religion will join with apostate government and sentence to death those who do not conform. Now that sentence is very important. It sums up the eschatology of the New Testament. At the end of the world, apostate religion, when the world's in crisis, the sort of thing we're having now is a sort of an anticipation of what will happen. Just like every sickness is a mini death, so all the crises the world knows, like 1929 and now, intimate what will be worldwide in a greater intensity at the end of time. And at such a time of darkness, the world will try and find a way out and it will adopt a false religion and church and state will agree on it. It will exalt mankind. It will be somewhat like some of the stuff that's been very popular in the West in recent years. But it will not be the Christian gospel. And if you don't conform, you'll be declared an outsider and worthy of death and the hour will be fixed for the execution of all Christians who refuse to conform to apostate religion, apostate government and that's when Christ returns. That's Armageddon. Would you look with me at Revelation 19? Here in Revelation 19 we read about the last great war, not between nations but between good and evil. Please look at verse 19 of chapter 19. <coughs> then I saw the beast, Revelation 13, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Who's that? Look at verse 11. I saw heaven standing open. And there stood before me a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. 
He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. That's quoting from Isaiah 63. And his name, the word of God, Christ. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth a sharp sword, symbolism, with which to strike down the nations. He'll rule them with an iron scepter, alluding to Psalm 2, which says the nations rebel against God but he will break them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress, another allusion to Isaiah 63, the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. And then you have the result in verse 17 on. I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather yourselves for the great supper of God. You may eat the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men, horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. That's the great supper of the death of the wicked. Look now at chapter 14, if you would, 14. Here again it will quote from what we read in Isaiah 63. Verse 9 onward, <coughs> chapter 14. <coughs> A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He'll be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There's no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image. Remember in Isaiah, no rest, peace for the wicked or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Now, verse 14. I looked and there stood before me a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle going to reap the harvest of earth. Another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle, reap. The time to reap has come, the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Come down to verse 19. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Isaiah 63. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city. Blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 600 stadia. That's about 180 miles. 